Hey, so um, we are launching in to a new series called Connected, uh, a new way to live. We're, we're trying to take a look at what would life be like if it was all connected to somebody besides you. You know, kind of how we started off with, and, and Matt Chandler in his, in his series, Beautiful Design, which, which some of you are, are going through with the church right now, um, starts off by saying this, it's not about you. It's not about you. Now, for some of you, you're super ticked at that. You like it when life is about you. For some of you, you're really relieved because you have tried to make life about you and you realize it doesn't work that way. So wherever you may be, we're just excited you're here. So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at how would life change if every moment was really connected to another person named Jesus Christ? Like, what would life look like? How would that absolutely um, rearrange some of the dynamics of what you're experiencing today? Because here's some of the things that we believe. Let me just, let me front load you with this, with this idea. We believe that when you begin to see all of life connected to Jesus, relationships change, emotions change, affections, appetites change. Everything changes actually for the better. He's actually the thing that you've been longing for, but you don't necessarily know that. Um, and we're going to kind of unpack that. And, and you can agree or disagree throughout, uh, but that's, that's where we're going to go because all of Scripture actually goes there. When we read Scripture, we see that every piece of Scripture actually points um, to this person of Jesus. And so as we are looking at all of life pointing to Jesus, we're going to look at some passages in the Old Testament that actually point up to Jesus. And in the theme of being connected, what's really cool is we are doing this in concert with our Avenue Kids. So we have an Avenue Kids program that's happening right now. We've got a ton of kids over on that side of campus um, from zero to fifth grade, and then now even our youth, although the youth's doing something different, but zero to fifth grade. And what they're doing is what we're going to be doing for the next few weeks. We're going to actually be in the same passages, working through the same type themes that they are in an effort to understand that when Jesus is the center of your life, he actually not only connects us and all of life to him, but he he connects us as a family in a new way. And so we thought it would be cool to learn as a family uh, for a few weeks. And so we're excited to be doing that. If you have a child over there, make sure to maybe take some notes, like lock in, and then ask them, hey, what's, what happened? What did you learn? And, and maybe do some, some comparison. And so I'm going to pray, and then we're going we're gonna to launch in. So, Father, we ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, and you would help us to see and experience all of life being connected to the person of Jesus. Help us in these ways we ask, Spirit. Christ in your name, amen. So the question I want to launch off with before we begin is, what do you want? Or maybe better ask, what do you really want? So if I were to ask you to think through, turn to somebody. I'm not going to ask you to turn to somebody because some of you like that, some of you don't. So I'm going to actually vote in favor for those who don't like that. I normally go the other way, but I'm, the introverts, you're winning this morning. Um, think through this. What is it that you really want out of life? Like even maybe right now in this particular moment, what, it, what do you want? Like, like what, has, what is your life about right now? What's your, what's your greatest um, hope or aspiration or, or appetite, even, even like right now in this moment? Are you, are you wanting to maybe not feel a certain way? Are you wanting a person who doesn't want you back? Are you wanting to maintain how things are right now? Are you, are you wanting something that you don't have? Are you wanting more of something? What do you really want? Um, we're going to kind of explore However it is that you're answering that question right now, I wonder if there isn't a, a bit more of a deeper driving answer to that. So um, we have to start off with a story. You know, like every good story uh, has, a, has a beginning and a middle and an end. So for us to launch into some Old Testament stuff, you would need to know, like, where we are on that. So you know how your phones have a current location? If you were to, like, look at your phone and you could push that little thing and it give you a current location? I want to give you a current location to a better story, uh, and, and then we're going to launch into the Old Testament narrative about a guy named Saul. But if I just start talking to you about Saul, some of you are going to know who Saul is, and some of you are going to have no idea about who Saul might be. So um, here's what I do know. Most of you know about Netflix. 
Most of you might be fans or subscribers to Netflix. And the cool thing about Netflix is when you're in the midst of a series, it's usually about one kind of common theme or, or person. There's usually a hero, although you might not know who that hero is all the way along. By the time you get to the end of the story, you can start piecing things together and being like, oh, like I see how that pointed to that. So let me just back up. For those of you who are not into the Netflix era, but you, you let's just go sagas of like Star Wars, okay? I'm talking old school Star Wars. You know, like Empire Strike Back type thing. Um, and, and so you know that it's, at some level, it all pointed. And now, listen, you can disagree with me. If you're like a Star Trek, like, I, I'm not, I, don't, I don't know what the word would be. Like, if you're a big Star Trek fan, you might disagree with me. Just like when I mentioned the Netflix series, you might. So I'm not here to, like, argue that. I'm just here to say that essentially the Star Wars saga points to Luke, at least in that genre of it. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, dude, that, that's his sister? Whoa, weird. You know what I mean? And then you're like, oh, that's his dad? Wow, I didn't see that coming. And, and you realize that it's this one guy that's got to bring, like, balance and things like that back, back kind of to the force. And, okay, so if, if you were to, like, dissect the story bigger, you might see other people in that. I totally get that. But, but you get what I'm saying? It's like the story's really cool, but it seems to point to, like, a hero that sometimes you know about and sometimes you don't. Some of you are Stranger Things fans, right? And so, again, I'm mentioning Netflix, and, and you're starting to think, okay, you, there's only two series in it. Some of you, did anybody binge watch any of that? Just, just see, if, see if there's some people around here that don't make me feel weird. Okay, great, awesome. So my kids brought me up to speed on it, and I was like, yeah, I need to like, be, like, know what my kids are into. And then I'm like, get out of my way, another. <laughs> it's 1.30, Daddy. I don't care. Go to bed, another. You know? So we, we, we had like some... some binging and fun, fun with that, and, you know, I don't remember all the details. I just remember it was like, wow, this is really interesting, and it's like, oh, oh, so, so this, is, this is kind of like about maybe 11, and, and oh, oh, and so I see, and, and so you start to put things together in the story that are saying, hey, this interesting, weak, and vulnerable person is probably going to be the hero at great expense to herself. Interesting. Interesting plot line. Now, it doesn't work out quite as well with The Office, okay? But if you're an Office fan, and so if you're an Office fan, you might think I'm going to say Dwight Schrute. I'm not. It's not about Dwight. But you know that in most episodes of The Office, it comes back to one person kind of bringing balance to The Office, normality to The Office, and explaining kind of the way forward. You actually start rooting for Jim along the way. He's got some vulnerable qualities, and you're like, come on, Jim and Pam. And, and like, you, you begin to understand like, there's a lot of details and stuff happening, but it actually focuses on one particular person. And like, that narrative carries everything else. Well, the scripture is the one that has front-loaded all those good stories. Do you understand that the reason you binge watch Netflix and the reason I go over to my good friend's house and watch multiple Star Wars movies is, is because we love a good story. Why? Because we were created in the image of the best storyteller. It's a common theme whether you like are, are down with the Jesus thing or not. Everyone loves a great, great story. And what that says is that there's probably some image, there's probably someone that you were created like who's into stories as well. And so what we want to do here is just briefly say, hey, here's, here's where we are in the better story. Because in all of those narratives, they all point to one central figure. That's just what the Bible does. The Bible has four chapters to its story. It's got a creation chapter where all things were good and awesome. And then it has a fall chapter where... where Sin came into the world, and people started to think life was about them. They actually started to think like they were the point. And when that happened, everything broke down. And, and not only did they break down, but also their relationship with their creator broke down. And like they, they could no longer relate to God the way that they were intended to. And as a matter of fact, it wasn't just that they couldn't relate to him in that moment, but that God being holy, righteous, and just he would have to bring a consequence to their rebellion. It goes beyond just kind of like, oh, I'm being a little selfish today. No, see, humanity chose another way outside of God and said, God, I understand, but, but no thank you. 
And God had to do something about that. And so, so the fall is the chapter that, that we have all experienced. We live in a world of hurricanes and poverty and cancer. That's actually not the way it's supposed to be. Those are all results of our world being broken and, and shattered from the effects of sin. Now, I don't mean that like oh, this, partic- this particular person's sin brought about this particular hurricane. No, I mean just things don't work the way they were supposed to. But God didn't leave us in that situation. He didn't leave us in that crisis. The next chapter of the story after the fall is redemption. And redemption is when God decided to act on his behalf and our behalf and come and say, listen, you're going you're gonna to remain in this world for a little bit longer, but I'm going to make you mine again. I'm going to remove the consequences that have your name upon them, and I'm going to put them on the name of the hero of the story that nobody expects, whose name is not Jim or Eleven or Luke, but whose name is Jesus. And Jesus will stand in a place that you should be standing in, and on that cross, I will pour out my wrath on him that you should have deserved. And Jesus will die a death to redeem you. He will die a death not simply to be a martyr, but his death will purchase you out of the slavery of separation that you should be experiencing from me. And so when Jesus rose on the third day, it wasn't just that his disciples were like, oh, that's awesome to see you. It was a cosmic event. As a matter of fact, we see cosmic consequences on that day. Like things happened on that day that people cannot explain. Why? Because it was... God Almighty saying, you can come back. I've created a way for you to be mine again. And the final chapter is renewal or restoration. We're not there yet. We're in, the, we're in chapter 3 of redemption where redemption is offered to all of us. If we will, by faith, trust in Christ's work on our behalf, if we'll turn from us being the point to Jesus being the point and put all our chips on his finished work, If we'll be like, man, I quit on me, Jesus, you're it, or I got nothing. When you come to faith in Christ like that, you're forgiven of sin, you're adopted into the family, you're made new, your shame begins to be washed away, your guilt begins to fade. I mean, it all happens in a moment, but you start to experience it more and more and more over a life. And then Jesus makes this other promise that I'm coming back. So the anxiety that you still feel today and the depression that you still walk through and the brokenness of how we maybe did this or did that, like, like your divorce and that, all that stuff, it's still relevant today. But listen, I'm prom- because of my resurrection, I promise that for those of you who have put your faith in me, you're no longer under the condemnation of the Father. You're now under the adoption of the Father, and I'm going to renew all things for you, even what has caused you your greatest pain. I'm going to touch that. I'm going to call it mine. And then I'm going to like give it back to you renewed for your joy and my glory. I mean, that's the kind of craziness we believe. So if you wonder why we sing and our hands go up and people are like lost in worship, it's because we believe the stories about a guy who's actually doing that right now. So listen, we in this story, we're in between chapters three and four, redemption and renewal. And we're looking, we're like, okay, Jesus, we're ready. Okay, man, oh, no, not today. Okay, cool. We're, we're right there. What we're going to look at today in the scripture was, was before the redemption chapter, before Jesus came, and it was, it was like in the, in the fall chapter, chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to be in 2 Samuel, and we're just going to be kind of, um, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel, and it's a, it's a really long narrative. I'm going to get right to the point of, of the narrative and, and and we'll, we'll explore a few things here. Oh, there's my stool. So in, in 1 Samuel, you, you should see it on your outlines there. Love for you to take a look at this at home. Chapter 13, verses 1 through 14. And then um, chapter 15, 1 through 35. And, and basically what you're going to see is that he, here's the deal. Let me, let me give you the spark notes again to this portion of the Old Testament. God said he was going to um, do a work, you know, like he wanted to do a work through a certain people. Because God always does his work in like the remnant. You know, like some of us are, we might be upset that Christianity is losing the mainstream in, in our nation or in the world. It's okay. Listen, God always thrives in the margins. Okay, so, so it's, it's okay. God's still on his throne doing his thing no matter what happens around us. And so God was like, man, I'm going to work in a remnant. And, and then um, the, the, that remnant of people, it, it came through an, an era called the Judges. 
And one of the things with the judges is God would raise up some strong people that would help bring stability to what he was doing. But then, but then it just became a mess. And it seemed like the scripture says the people always ended up doing kind of what they thought best. Have you ever noticed where your best thinking gets you? <laughs> it's usually not good. I mean, outside of Christ. If, you're, if the Holy Spirit lives within you, which is one of the things that, that believers get, so they get a new mind, sometimes that changes, and, and that's awesome. But, but when I'm thinking outside of Jesus, my best thinking usually gets me um, not in a good space, and that's where God's people were. And so you know what they really wanted? They wanted a king. They looked around, and they saw all the other people, all the other nations, and you know what all the other nations had? They had a king. So we're like, man, we don't, we just need a king. That's what we need. Have you ever done that? Have you ever looked around, you're, you're, you've got a problem, you've got an issue, you know, you're on Facebook or you're on, you know, whatever social media thing, you got, and you're like, man, if I just had that, things would be better. Well, you're welcome to God's people. That's, that's one of our, our, our struggles. And, and so they're like, man, we just need a king. And there's this guy, Samuel. Who, who spoke to the people on God's behalf. And he's like, you don't need a king, you already have a king. God is your king. You know, it was kind of like, yeah, 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 what else? We need a, like, a legit king. And Samuel's like, no, no, you don't want to do this, man. You've got what you need. And the people are like, uh, you know, okay, can you just get us a king, man? Can you make this thing happen? Have you ever been there? Where it's like the promises of God are speaking directly to your situation. And you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. But this is what I really need. Well, that's where God's people were. So, man, be encouraged because God's got good news for you. And so anyways, Saul, he's like, all right, here you go. And Saul was the guy that was anointed king. Now, the whole kind of message could be about Saul and, and just some of the things. And there's going to be a portion where we do some teaching through Saul. But remember, if it all points to Jesus, we got to make this thing always about Jesus. So let's take a look at Saul, but only as a mirror to Jesus. Okay, cool, great. I, I don't even know that you had a choice. I just, this is kind of like a running dialogue and monologue in my head. So I'm thinking you're, you're good with that. So the reason Saul didn't work out as a king, it's given to you in your outline. Uh, we've got the scripture up here. And basically this is why um, they, they had the wrong guy. If we can get that scripture up, yeah. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord, has sought at, at, the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So basically, we've got this, I mean, we can just like get right to the heart of the issue, and we're going to talk about some ways this showed up, but it's just that Saul wasn't a guy after God's own heart. It was a heart issue. It actually wasn't a behavior issue. We're going to look at some behaviors, but the only way the behaviors change, at least in a meaningful way, is if the heart changes. I mean, you probably know that to be true in your own life. You can change some behaviors for a while, but if your heart's still the same, you'll either go back or they'll just completely exhaust you trying to be someone you're not. And the problem is Saul wasn't a guy who followed God. He's, he, wasn't a guy, he, he, he wasn't a guy after God's own heart, actually, I should, I should specifically say. And we're going to see some ways in which that played out. But one of the biggest problems that, that God had with Saul and and. Your, your kids are going to have this message called um, God Rejects Saul. So if you want to kind of be thinking about those, those words and, and how you're going to connect with them, um, one, of the, one of the main reason that God rejects Saul is because he's just not a guy after his own heart. Like God is, um, he's a lot of things, but one of the things he is is uh, I, I feel like he's a romantic. And I don't mean that in the like, okay, like nothing else matters. I'm, he's a warrior. He's a ton of things. But let's not downplay the fact that God is a romantic and he's really after your heart, not, not some, like, behavior modifications. He, he wants you to fall deeply in love with him, and then he wants to give you more and more of himself. Again, why do you love a good love story? <laughs> because you're created in the image of the greatest romantic who ever was. So how do, how do we know that, that, that Saul was, like, the wrong guy? Well, Saul suffered from um, this thing that many of you might suffer from, and it's called IGT. IGT. Now, now, not a ton of people can diagnose it, but I have certainly been qualified to diagnose it because I suffer from it as well. And IGT is a disease that is anti-God. 
is so if you have God over here and you have IGT, you're going to need to get IGT cured before you're going to be able to get more of the person of God. And here's, here's what IGT is. IGT is a disease that affects many of us. It can actually come and go. It is contagious, so be, cl- be careful when you get close to me. Be careful when you actually start to see my heart because it could leap from my heart to yours. So that's why the scriptures always talk about guarding your heart. IGT means I got this. I got this. Saul suffered from a severe case of IGT. So I was in London for about six days, and I was over there studying, um, I don't want to call it a program, but like a a journey, if you will, called Alpha. And we're going to be launching that um, this year. 2019 is our plan. And, And so I went over there to take a look at what, what, what's the culture of Alpha, and, and, and wh- how is God affecting a post-Christian culture through this particular um, uh, opportunity? And, so, and what does it look like for us to bring that back here? So I was over, over in London, and, and it, was, it was so awesome. If you know, I'm just going to let you in a little bit to kind of some of, some of my weirdnesses. I'm a, I love to wander. I love to wander. Maybe that's why I can never finish a message <laughs> because I like end up wandering over here. I'm like, come on, stick with what you... Anyways, um, I'm a wanderer, and my wife, it used to make her super mad because I would just wander off and not tell her. And I learned early, don't do that, man. If you're going to wander, just be like, I need, I'm going to go here. We, we were at a spring training game, and I would go on. I want to go see what else is happening. I want to go look at the shop. I want to go look at the field from all over the place. And it was like, where'd he go? Well, he's, he's wandering. By that time, she, she told one of our friends that we went to the game with, this is what he does. It's okay. And I learned to inform my wife that, though, when I do that. Because there was one time it got really bad. My parents got involved. It was like, is he okay? You know, it's bad when you're an adult and your parents are like, are you okay? Like, that was just a bad scene. Anyway, so I'm learning, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do my thing. So in London, you can imagine I love to wander, it's actually one of, it's, I think maybe one of the reasons, I don't know, why this stage way back here from you guys is like, it's, this feels better sometimes to be with you guys, just kind of wander out to you. And so in London, I was just wandering in the morning. I like to run, and maybe a normal run might be 30 to 45 minutes. And so in, in, in London, I had my phone. I knew enough that this, this could happen. I also, also love downtowns and big cities. So I just went, and I had, I had time in the morning. I get up early. I just wandered, and I didn't have like a core. Like, I knew we had seen Westminster Abbey, and that was like kind of over there, and the, the palace, I think, was somewhere over there. But that's the cool part about being a wanderer is you don't need to know. You might find it. You might not. But the cool thing is what you find is going to be pretty awesome. And so I just went out wandering, and the first morning I went out, um, you know, remember my runs are about 45 minutes, but when I was in London, I was like, maybe I'll do an hour. Well, by the time I got back two hours after I left, I realized that, that either my phone doesn't work or I'm, I just, I don't work over in London. So this happened multiple mornings, but every morning it happened, I said pretty much the same thing. My IGT rose up through the roof, and I was like, I got this. Like, I, I'm, I am like... Magellan when it comes to directions over here. <laughs> and over there, I, tur- I don't know who I turned into. I just, I couldn't find my way back. And so, but my IGT wouldn't allow me to necessarily like ask for help besides on my phone. I, I could do that. I was looking on my phone. And so this one morning, I really needed to get back to this one thing that was going to be super special about why I had gone there. And I just, my IGT and I were fighting. Because, oh, if you quit running and you like, you walk back, you lost, <laughs> okay? That's, a, that's an L in the category, okay? So two hours of running, I actually ran about a half marathon, literally. And, but, I, but, but you know, IGT, right? So this one morning, I, just, I, I was running out of time. My phone was running out of battery, so I actually, I lost, and I had to raise my hand super, like, here I am in London, sweaty, and I, and I, and I raised my hand for the Uber to come and take me to my destination. And it wasn't until I gave up on me, raised my hand, and asked somebody besides myself to help that I got to a place I couldn't get to on my own. And when I look at the story of the gospel, that's the gospel narrative. It's like until you quit and raise your hand and say, I can't do this. I'm tired of living like this. Jesus, will you come in and take me to a place that I could never get to on my own? The gospel and you will run side by side, but you will never be affected the way that God's called you to be. 
IGT will absolutely separate you from this for the rest of your life until you raise your hand. Hey, so where did, it, where did it show up in Saul's life? Well, check this out. Maybe you can relate to some of this stuff. We're going to run through the narrative pretty quick, and, and maybe some of this stuff will hit you, maybe not. Let's go ahead and take a look at some of these IGT moments. So in, in 1 Samuel 13, 9, he's told to wait. Don't make the sound. You know, he's like, wait on the Lord. And Paul's like, I, or Saul's like, I waited for a little bit, and then he couldn't wait anymore. He's like, why wait? So he just took matters into his own hands. IGT. I'm not going to wait on what God told me to do. IGT, man. I tried that for a little bit. It didn't work. IGT. How about 15.9? We can do better. They were supposed to, like, like, end the enemy. And he ends the enemy except for a little bit that he wanted to keep. IGT, man. Like, I'll follow God to a point, but, you know, it's got to make sense to me. And so, you know, we can probably do better than what God has asked us to do. I like how, what he says here in 1 Samuel 15. I'm a pretty good dude, and your God will accept me. It's a little bit of a paraphrase for me. But, but <laughs> that's, that's kind of what he says when he's confronted with his IGT. He's like, yeah, I know I got some IGT, but I'm a pretty good guy. And I know that, you know, kind of based on my performance, I know that'll be cool with your God. It's interesting because in the narrative, he says your God. It doesn't say my God. So he, he already is distancing himself from the living God. And one of the ways that he does it naturally is when he just steps into his IGT. And he actually thinks, check this out, he actually thinks that because he's maybe better than most or better than the standard that he sees around him, he thinks his performance is going to make him acceptable to a perfect and holy God. That's crazy. That's like the epitome of IGT, that God accepts good people. Listen, that's like saying IGT in a really sweet and kind way. But the scriptures are like, no, no, no. Like, your heart is evil. Sin has corrupted it. And unless you raise your hand and look outside yourself, you will die separated under the wrath of that holy and just and loving God whom you said no thanks. Where else, is, where else is this IGT come up um, in 1 Samuel 15, 17? He's kind of like, well, what does it really matter? You know, like, he's, be, he's being reminded that, like, you might be small in your own eyes, but, dude, you were God's chosen person. And he's kind of trying to step away from consequences. Like, well, I don't, IGT, what does it really matter? 15, 24 says, I'm, I, I, too, am looking for a king. Um, this, is, this is a really important verse where he talks about, like, man, I just kind of did what the, what the people wanted. It was his way of saying, I'm looking for a king too. I'm looking for a, someone or something greater than this because I realize at the end of the day, this doesn't cut it. I need a higher power. I need something more. Dude, it's a story that we all tell. It's not specific to anyone because it's a universal story. We are all longing for a better king. And in 1 Samuel 15, 26, he just follows his own heart. I mean, that's another kind of Oprah way of saying IGT. Like, I'll just do what seems best to me and, and be true to me. But if me is not right with God, that's a dangerous choice. It's IGT. It's IGT. We all have it, right? And so, hey, let's, let's, let's keep moving because here's what Samuel says. Because you have rejected me, or because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Okay, so that's a problem when you live with IGT. Like you, you reject the grace of God in favor for your disease of IGT. And you don't get God. God will look to you the same way he looks to Saul. If you're rejecting, if you're going to live out of IGT, I can't know you. I can't have you. You are not accepting my offer of grace. And my answer is rejection. You see, um, I am convinced we, we all long for a better king. No matter who you are, no matter what situation you brought in here, I'm convinced that we all have this longing for a better king because we're all created in the image of the God who has given us that better king. So 
Where, where does Jesus come into this? What's the Christ connect? Another key word that your kids uh, probably will know from AC Kids. Did you know that in AC Kids, every week with their, with their planning, they have a Christ connect? Is it not the coolest thing ever that your kids are growing up every time they open the scriptures, having some adult who loves Jesus and loves them saying, here, well, this is what the passage says about Noah or Adam and Eve or Jonah or this or that, and let me show you how it points to Jesus. Like, that's awesome. That's exactly where I want my kids. And so that's, that's, let's look at the Christ Connect here in this passage. The Christ Connect is that there's another king that came in this really awesome story that actually did have a heart that, that followed after God, and his name is Jesus. And it's a weird paradox, right? Watch this. So because of Jesus' obedience, he actually gets rejected so that we can be accepted. Let me say that again because that's the gospel. Because of Jesus' obedience and saying, yes, I'll go to the cross and take on their sin, the Father actually rejects him, although it be for a moment he does on the cross because he's become the sin of the world and he's, Jesus is like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? There was, there was a, like, the father had to turn his back on the son because the son had become sin. And there was a moment of rejection that would allow people like you and people like me to be accepted. Interesting Christ connect that this king that failed pointed to the fact that we needed another king who would succeed. Do you know every failure in your life is super awesome? I know it doesn't feel super awesome. I know that you probably have spent years working out a, a, a good pattern of how to punch yourself in the face, or if you're a little bit more theological, take sort of like the, the, some sort of like whip and whip your back over guilt and shame and addiction, your, your divorce, your relapse. You, you looked at porn again. You did this. You did that. And so you, you've actually probably by now developed a pretty good habit of, of like hurting yourself after you hurt yourself. But I want to tell you some good news, guys. Every single one of your failures is awesome. Why? Because it points to your need for a better king. Can we just be there for a second? I know people have been hurt. I know that it's like in, in a lot of ways you wouldn't want to say, hey, that's awesome that I failed there. But I want you to see the gospel redemption possibility of every single one of your failures, even in this moment when life's not working out, when you've got the shambles of life hurting you, they all point to your need for a better king. Jesus would love to be that. He would love to be that better king. You see, in, in this uh, paradigm, we have now three options left. Because Jesus invites you to bring all of those failures and, and all of those successes and all of those IGT moments to him and just lay them down and say, Jesus, like, will you take me in all this? The answer already is yes. The answer is already for yes. Because of that, you now have three choices. Here are your choices. You can either pursue a life of legalism um, where, where you're like, okay, I'm hearing what this guy's saying, and I get it. So God rejected Saul because he made a bunch of mistakes, so I'll just try harder. Don't ever do that. Don't ever leave this church thinking you've got to do better so God will accept you. Ever. Don't ever tell your kids that. Don't ever parent. Don't ever have a marriage that's based on, man, I'm going to stay committed to you. I'm going to give you my affection as long as you meet my needs. Stop it. That's heretical. It's legalism. So if you've heard anything that smacks of, man, Saul made some mistakes that I'm not going to make so God accepts me, don't do it. Well, you could go to the other, the other way and you could go to license and you could be like, oh, so what he's saying is Jesus died for me. I can be forgiven in Jesus. So what that means is now I have a license to do whatever I want to whomever I want. It's like go time. You know, like I get the Jesus thing and so now no shame, no guilt. I just get to live life however I want. Don't do that because you will have missed grace. Because grace may find you exactly where you are, but real grace never leaves you where it found you. Your really only option here is love. Love. Here's the option to Jesus' invitation to be your better king, that you would, would say, I get it. I'm, I'm not the point. IGT, I get all that stuff. Jesus, I, I surrender. I give you 
everything that I have. Here I am. I'm believing that you want it and you want to do something better with it. And then you just start walking. Slowly at first and then quicker and it may be a crawl in some seasons, but you keep walking and you keep walking and you keep walking and you let love be your motivation. You let the love of the Father for you through Christ be your motivation for your love to that Father. And you start being motivated by loving the Father who loved you first. And you start to see things change in your life slowly and over time, and you begin to experience more of that Father of love. What might that look like? I mean, I think there's, as, as we kind of get ready to, to close up and, and, and make some just kind of practical landing points here, um, it's, it's got a couple of places where, where it's going to land, but I know God wanted me to say this to you. And then, and then we'll, we'll get ready to close. Jesus is what you've always wanted. Jesus is what you've always wanted, no matter who you are, no matter what you came in. You know, I went and I prayed over some sections this morning, and I prayed for that section. I don't know if this is going to mean anything or not. That's in, that's, I prayed for encouragement back there. I prayed that this section would worship like they've never worshiped before. I prayed that dead people would come to life in this section. And you know, like you're spiritually dead, that means you're not connected to Jesus, and then, then you, you get connected to Jesus by faith, and you come alive. I prayed that that section back there would see things like, that, like they, would, they might have been blind, but now they can see Prayed that that section, like, uh, I think it was like that your hearts would be wooed. I'm sorry, I can't remember what I prayed for you guys right now. <laughs> it's super rude, I know. <laughs> Jesus, if you want to give it to me, that'd be awesome, but whatever. Um, look, I just want to say this as lovingly as I can. If, if, I, if my... If my if, I, if this is my last day, right? I got my daughter over there. If this is my last day, here's what I want. Here's what I want her to hear. Jesus will be what you always want. You might not know it. You might not sense it. Forget, like, oh, he's what I need. I want, no, 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 no. Listen, at the heart of your heart, you have an appetite. Eternity was set in your heart, and Jesus is actually what you've always wanted and will always be your greatest want. So I'm inviting you. We're going to do communion, man. I'm inviting you to come to him in faith and receive who you've always wanted. And we're going to take communion. Maybe you've wondered what this might look like, how this get, plays out. Well, it seems like Saul gave us some pretty good practicalities here. I'm going to ask my guys who serve communion if you guys want to make your way forward. As we think about some of those examples of Saul, he heard voices, you know? It said that, like, throughout his life, he heard voices. I hear voices. <laughs> it would be weird if I end the sermon right there, right? That would be super <laughs> awkward and weird. <laughs> like the sixth sense or something. Like, what is this guy? He watches Stranger Things. What's his matter with him? I hear voices. You know what some of the voices I hear? I hear the voice of control. Just like Saul did. Why wait? Man, I hear that. Here's what it might look like if you were to invite Jesus to come be that better king. It might look like that when you hear that voice, you don't say IGT. You're like, my, king's, my, king, my king has this. My king has this. I hear voices of telling me that my treasure's not in Jesus, that my treasure's out there, just like Saul did. I hear voices that tell me to, that there's God's, God's holding out on me and I can find something better. But when Jesus becomes your king, you can hear different voices, something like this. I'm your good. I'm your good. I'm the one you've always been looking for. You can remind yourself, my, my king is better. You might hear voices of approval, like Saul did, like I just want to do what the people wanted me to do. I hear that voice. I just want to win the approval of those around me because I can see them and taste them and touch them and they're there. But if Jesus were your better king, you could hear another voice that says, 
I already approve of you fully. Even if you go back to that in this situation, even if you go back to looking for approval outside of me, I already approve of you because of what I accomplished at the cross. So you don't need to live like that right now. You might hear voices like this that say, um, kind of a voice approving, a voice, a voice that, that looks for security in anyone and anything, and it might even drive your anxiousness like it does mine. But in those moments, you could hear another voice that says, I'm really super secure in my king, and I know that his resurrection means I can quit proving myself, and I can rest. All of us are looking for a king who's that good, who's that gracious, who's that great, and who's that glorious. There's only one king that can do that for you. That's the person of Jesus. And so at this moment, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna stop and we're gonna transition shortly here into communion, but I'm just believing that the spirit wants to bring some people to life today through faith. Like that, that you didn't know God in this way and then now you're gonna know God when you come to this moment of surrender and it's absolutely going to be life-changing both now and forever. And I just think the spirit wants to do that in our midst. And if you already know God in that way, then you're gonna need to pray along with me. And if you don't, then uh, this is an opportunity for you to, to invite that king in. So let's just all pray. Let's just all pray. And, um, so Father, um, you know, you, you work in moments of a lifetime. And yeah, you, I just think you want me to be bold right now and say that there's, there's gotta be people in here who came in for this moment. You might never be back, it's okay. But, but they came in for this moment. And so, Father, I pray that you would fill us with your spirits and, and you, would, um, you would do what, what you came to do, which is bring life, seek and save the lost. Give people that better king that can give them those things that they can't have outside of it. So, Father, at the risk of being odd, cheesy, or weird, because I know you're not those things, uh, I know that you kind of put it on my heart to give that example of the hand raised and that um, until I was willing to raise a hand and like publicly ask for help um, it didn't come and I know it's not a work and you do it in your own timing but Father if there's some here who are ready to invite Jesus in to be their better king I'm just going to keep this moment of prayer but would you just raise your hand almost like the scene of me in London. Like I need, I need help greater than myself. I want, I want this good and great king. I'm tired of my IGT. So just go ahead and keep your hand up. I see that and we're gonna pray and, and then you mark this moment. Thank you for your for your courage to ask, even publicly now. And, and you can pray however you want, but it should be a theme like this. Jesus, I realize that I am a sinner and I am in need. And I invite you to be my better king. I believe that you can forgive me because of your death and resurrection. Would you do that now? And would you give me this life that I heard about today? I turn from myself to you. You can put your hand down, thank you. If you come to him in that way by faith, there is new life that abides, abounds in you. Father, help us to celebrate that new life in this moment of communion now. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.